Hi everyone, my name is Lizzie Chan. I'm a member of the CPR Institute's Young Leaders in Alternative Dispute Resolution Steering Committee. I am delighted to host today's episode of our Corporate Council interview series. The YADR seeks to educate the next generation of leaders on the full spectrum of dispute resolution and management techniques, and to provide an insider's view on into how CPS community of corporate counsel, law firm counsel, and other experts in the field are using dispute prevention and resolution techniques to manage conflict. As part of this goal and this interview series, we will ask corporate counsel to share their in-house perspectives on dispute resolution mechanisms and their advice for young practitioners. Today, we welcome Jason Klingen Smith, who is the Assistant General Counsel at General Motors in Detroit. He is also the co-chair of the CPR YD, YADR Steering Committee. Jason, we're very happy to have you here today. And my first question is about your career. So I know you initially worked as um, external legal counsel before moving into your in-house counsel role. Can you tell us a bit about that move? Yes, hi Lizzie, and, and thanks so much for giving me this opportunity to, to speak with you. Um, yes, I was a, a trial lawyer in uh, in Detroit for about 20 years prior to moving over to General uh, General Motors, and I loved being an external uh, counsel. Um, was fortunate enough to participate uh, in, in a lot of trial work in the U.S. and a lot of arbitrations, um, and then a small number of arbitrations uh, internationally during during my time in practice. And I actually never really considered seriously going um, into a corporation, but I had the opportunity through um, a recruiter who contacted me and, and raised the possibility. And uh, my wife and I uh, are, are very much tied to the Detroit area. And so with a company like General Motors being in Detroit, um, I was in Detroit, it was very hard to pass up. And as I you know, was able to learn more about the opportunity, I realized that it was a tremendous opportunity um, to not always try cases or litigate cases, but to be in a position to manage litigation, manage disputes, and hopefully um, find ways to, to resolve them um, when possible. And so I came in-house uh, in November of 2017, uh, and it's certainly been an, an exciting time <laughs> to be in a corporation um, during that time, and, and I've enjoyed it. But, um, you know, it goes to show, quite frankly, that in your career, um, certainly where you start is, is most likely not where you're going to finish, and uh, you never know what opportunities might, might come your way. Absolutely. And on that note, what would be your advice for young practitioners, especially those looking to move in-house? Yeah, you know, I think um, the advice is, is pretty simple, which is, do whatever you can early in your career to do a lot. Um, if you know that you are in the litigation arbitration dispute area, you know that that is where your interest lies, um, then you're ahead of the game. I mean, when I was in law school, I didn't know if I wanted to be a transactional attorney or a litigator. I got into a, a firm. I thought I wanted to do litigation, so I sort of followed that, but it wasn't completely pre-planned or premeditated. I don't have a grand plan, but I enjoyed it more. And I think if you just get out and do things, try things in whatever, um, you know, setting that you find yourself in. If you um, want to be in a smaller law firm in government uh, practice, in large private practice, I guess my advice um, on, on if folks want to, to go in house is always be looking at for the opportunities. You're always going to need a base of knowledge in some form of practice before typically and most corporations do not hire right out of law schools but also keep your eye out I mean the, the the amount of access that the next generation now has to job opportunities through the internet is something that was just not around when I was you know starting my career and I would say this it, it's really when I look at it I see a lot of opportunities for more junior practitioners practitioners to get into a company and learn while they're at the company. So people are interested, I would say, while you typically need to establish a base of, of knowledge and expertise that for, uh, companies are willing to take uh, young talent and, and develop it in-house as well. Um, and then I guess I'd say for those who are in, interested in international arbitration in particular, I think the best advice I could give would be to identify lawyers, um, whether that they're, you know, not necessarily law firms, but lawyers, because lawyers who practice in the international arbitration area 
it's not a huge, huge network. And you have those folks everywhere from the largest firms to literally, you know, solo practitioners and a couple handful who only dedicate themselves to that and develop tremendous expertise and arbitrate cases all over the world. So you also have at your access, um, you know, research such as CPR and, and other places where you can really find out who's doing what and just um, try to make contact with those folks. So that's the, the high level advice I think I'd give. Thank you so much for that advice. And now I'd like to move to some questions about General Motors and its disputes practice. And my first question is, what kinds of disputes and disputes risks have you seen during the pandemic? You know, um, so I, I, I would focus on two primary areas of potential um, dispute. One um, is in our significant, significant supply base. Um, a typical automobile has tens and tens of thousands of components these days. Um, and a lot of them um, are not, you know, the typical hardware. It's, it's software and chips and, and things like that. Um, but every, every industry, every supplier was impacted um, by the pandemic and um, our supply was was impacted. Um, our, our ability to, to produce was impacted. And, you know, people have, entities have legal rights and obligations under agreements. Um, and the entire pandemic, though, was a tremendous lesson, I think, for us. We really took a collaborative approach with our supply base, understood that we were in this together, um, really managed and, and put to the side um, quite frankly, dozens, if not hundreds of potential disputes that, um, you know, were subject to terms and conditions, et cetera. Uh, but I think that was a really unique example of um, a tremendous volume of, of disputes that could have arisen and could have affected the ability of not only General Motors, but the suppliers to conduct business, and they were avoided. Um, I will say this, that, that one thing I've noticed um, in over the pandemic is that um, litigation finance and um, the entities who are getting involved in in litigation internationally and funding it, um, you know, there, there are some entities that have made quite a bit of money uh, in the pandemic and there's a lot of cash and, I, and we're seeing it hasn't necessarily affected us um, yet, but we're definitely seeing more activity um, in the claimants, you know, funding um, efforts and, and more claims getting filed. Um, one area uh, in particular um, are old patents, right? Patent rights that are acquired um, from entities that no longer operate. And, and so you see a little uptick there. Um, but generally speaking, uh, I think the pandemic induced a little bit of a, a decrease in disputes because there was so much volatility and you really, you couldn't, you couldn't dispute your way out of it. You had to work collaboratively. And what I'm concerned about is coming out of it, um, whether we're going to see a significant uptick or not. That's so interesting. So if we're seeing fewer disputes, why do you think we've seen a rise in litigation funding? You know, like I said, I, I believe that there um, has been generated some pretty significant um, cash reserves, quite frankly, throughout the pandemic and through stock markets that performed well. And I think that um, more and more funders are making cases, um, and I'm not sure it's, it's correct or incorrect, but um, making cases to folks to, to invest in litigation as a source of a potential financial return. And during the pandemic, have you made a choice between using litigation more or arbitration or a combination of both? You know, we always try um, as best we can to get our disputes into arbitration. We believe the, the advantages um, are, are tremendous. In the international um, area, uh, just as a matter of course, we, we include arbitration provisions in the vast majority of our contracts and our counterparties typically want to do so as well. So that's that's not a hard negotiation. Um, in the United States, um, we, we, we have a mix of both arbitration and litigation. We do um, undertake when we can a case-by-case -case analysis, assuming of course that we have the right, we don't always have the right um, to arbitrate. Um, we don't always have um, our standard terms and conditions in place. So yeah, I'd say internationally, it didn't change because we always look for arbitration and then domestically, um, it, it just, you know, we've been on a path to try to increase um, the number of matters that go to arbitration versus versus our courts. And have you tried formal mediation as well? 
Yes, we have uh, many, many cases, particularly through the pandemic. Um, all the mediators that we uh, have used typically or that's, uh, that are available from rosters, we're all very willing to do it um, remotely. Uh, we settled a number of cases in remote mediations. I find the remote mediation um, setting to be um, very amenable to, to resolving disputes. I mean, it's not ideal. Everyone wishes we could all be together, but it, it has served its purpose. Um, and then we've, we've undertaken virtual hearings and I know our lawyers have uh, deposed people you know, virtually and, and undertaken hearings. Uh, I think we will, we will be participating in our first um, virtual, virtual excuse me, arbitration hearings and trials in June, um, all things, you know, if, if all things go well. And my final question is, is there a dispute management and resolution technique that you've applied during the pandemic and that you think you'll continue to, to apply as we hopefully move out of the pandemic? Yeah, I do. And it goes back to the mediations. I was just thinking about this one that, um, you know, as, a, as an auto manufacturer of, of millions and millions of vehicles per year, we have smaller disputes, unfortunately, um, if, if a vehicle um, does not perform well. And um, we, ha we have undertaken um, mass mediations, taken, there are certain uh, law firms that take a lot of these cases in the consumer area, and we've undertaken in order to be more efficient. And also, it's a, we want our customers to be happy. We don't want claims from customers in the first place. And so we've implemented um, these mass mediations with um, a few claimants firms that bring a lot of those cases. Um, and we've found that to be an effective um, dispute uh, eliminator or terminator. Uh, it's been a good way to resolve disputes on a, on a large basis without going through the process of litigation for that many cases. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today, Jason. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much for having me, Lizzie. It's my pleasure.